Ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad you're here tonight. Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. I'm Diane Lipton. I've been the director here for a couple of years, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. And I think that Leslie's gone right now, but I, after, the, after this, I will introduce you to our new interim executive director, as well as the chair of our education committee, who will share with you some wonderful things that you can learn about how powerful our education team is and how you can experience more and more to help you become successful in the maritime industry. Let me tell you that tonight, if you want to be very successful very quickly at a very young age, I don't think there are any speakers better than the two people you're going to meet tonight to tell you, get you on the fast track, tell you how they did it, and if you'll follow their lead, there's no way you can fail. I promise you. They are really awesome, and it is really our pleasure to have them here. So, before we get started, I'd like to ask you, I'm going to pass this around. This is our... Um, a, record of who's here tonight we'd like to ask you please be sure you put your name down for us we'd like to keep a record of everyone who comes and also if you would give us your email address we'll make sure bless you if you would give us your email address we'll make sure that you hear about all of our upcoming lectures okay so please do that for us because you don't want to miss out on any of the wonderful things we have going here so i'm going to start right here with you okay if y'all just pass it around as the lecture is going on we'll get everybody's name okay so i'm going to introduce you first First, to our first speaker tonight, Rachel DeCordova. Rachel is a partner with Royston Razor at Vickery and Williams, and Royston Razor is a maritime attorney firm, one of the biggest and the best in the whole region, and she will tell you much, much more about it. Rachel has climbed that ladder so fast. She is so successful, and it has been my pleasure to know Rachel for, oh, about seven or eight years, and it's just been incredible how many things she gets involved in, how many things she manages, leads, besides having a family, taking care of two little boys at home. She is definitely, can balance anything and definitely a multitasker with every second of her time. So, she's gonna tell you how exciting life can be being an attorney in the maritime industry. And I'll tell you, she's not just an attorney. She knows everything that goes on every day around the world and specifically around our region and she's always involved in it. So, you are going to learn so much from this wonderfully successful lady. So please welcome Rachel to part. Okay, I don't know if I really need this, but I'm going to put it on. Let's see if I can manage to do this. Okay. All right, here we go. And um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my career in Admiralty and Maritime Law. Um, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about a few different parts of it. What's Maritime Law, who Royce and Razor is, what we do, sort of what a sample case is it's like that I might work on, and sort of what the day-to-day -day life of a maritime attorney is like. And um, then the benefits of a career as a maritime lawyer and how to become um, a maritime lawyer, if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, I actually am not just a maritime lawyer, but but that's what I'm going to focus on tonight, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, um, gosh, I hate this. Can everybody hear me if I talk without it? Yes. Yeah. No? You, you'll hear me. Trust me. Good. You just put your, do this if you need me to talk up, because I can't stand this. All right, so, uh, in the U.S., um, maritime law is pretty much defined by the Constitution. And it's Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution that determines the fact that the federal courts have admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. And um, if you were to remember back to your uh, Government 101 and US, U.S. Constitution, Article 3 is the part of our Constitution that gives uh, federal courts jurisdiction over certain cases, both creates them and says what they can hear and what they can't hear. And this is actually important, and I'm going to get to it in just a second, um, because there's very few areas of the law where the federal courts have original jurisdiction and that it's actually written into the Constitution. And our Constitution gives original jurisdiction in admiralty and maritime cases to our federal courts. Um, and the reason it's done that and not given it to our state courts where you'll, you'll find the majority of our lawsuits 
So most civil cases that you guys would know about or hear about on TV or see in a movie are going to be either criminal cases where someone is possibly going to prison for doing something they shouldn't have done or where somebody is suing somebody else for some kind of wrong and they're trying to get money from it, right? So, for example, if Todd were to get really mad at his dad and uh, decide to um, split his tires, don't do that, Todd, it's not a good idea. And then his dad were to sue him for property damages, you would do that in state court. And then if they, after, or after you know, he slid his tires, he got really mad and he got in a fight with his son and, and they got, came to blows, they could then, Todd could then sue his dad don't, don't get in the fight. And then they could, they could sue him for personal injury, and at the same time, they could get in a lot of trouble and, and they could go to court for um, hitting each other and assault and battery. But that would all happen in state court. In federal court, you can hear cases of jurisdiction where there is complete diversity between the parties. Everybody's in one state, companies in one state, and companies in another state, or you have foreign defendants and people in another state, or where there's a, a federal subject matter question. And there's very few instances where that happens. Almost every lawsuit that you hear about is going to happen in state court. But federal um, admiralty maritime jurisdiction happens in federal court, and that's because uh, cases of of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction have to have a uniform law from state to state all over the United <coughs> States. Moreover, admiralty and maritime law needs to be uniform in the United States similar to what you would have in Greece or China or Italy or England or anywhere in the world because it's a very international area of the law and we need to be able to uh, conduct um, trade and imports and exports with other countries where everyone can have um, a, a sort of a similar expectation of what is and isn't going to happen with these vessels when they're moving. And I know this might not seem like very interesting, but I can tell you that um, the ships and the, the things that move on them, if those ships stopped moving today, and everything that we have coming in on them or going out stopped moving, the world as you know it would cease to exist. And I kid you not. If you look around this room, I would be hard pressed to name almost anything, although we have some few old things in here that might not apply, anything that doesn't have some part or component part that didn't come from somewhere overseas. 95% of U.S.'s commerce, international commerce, moves on ships. And everything now is global, right? We don't, we don't live independently of other countries. If we don't have that commerce moving in and out on ships, the world as we know would cease to exist. Honestly, you would see riots in the street. The world would change so much so fast. And the problem is, when you have ships coming in into a port, well, your owner might be a Chinese company, and your master might be from Korea, and the rest of the crew might be from the Philippines. And if that ship leaves the United States, and there's an issue, a contract dispute, a personal injury, um, money's due on bunkers, the fuel that goes on the ships or other supplies, once they're gone, you're not gonna get that ship back here again. You may never get it back here again. And if you want to sue the owner to make them pay, good luck getting them to the United States. So we've created a sort of uh, fiction where you can actually sue the vessel. And we can go out and we can arrest the vessel. And it's not quite, I don't actually go and put handcuffs on the vessel when I arrest vessels, but you actually do hire um, uh, a federal sheriff of sorts, a marshal, and they actually go out and they paste a sign on the side of the ship and they stand guard and they stop the ship from leaving until they post a security with the court in the amount that is in dispute in the matter. This way, once the ship's gone, and it may never come back here again, 
you can still have the lawsuit go forward, and if the plaintiff wins, the, m the money is in the registry of the court so that the injured party can get paid. And this is one of the main mechanisms we have to allow, Diane, can you still hear me? Okay, the, one of the main mechanisms that we have that allows us to continue trading with our partners all over the world and everybody knowing that they can have an expectation that rights will be wrong or wrongs will be righted if they, if they occur. So, what is Admiralty and Maritime Law? What does it cover? Um, it's, it's actually, it covers anything that happens on navigable waters that relates to commerce. I mean, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And um, I make my money largely because people are fighting over what is or isn't admiralty law and whether maritime law does or doesn't apply and what is or isn't a vessel. Um, you can, depending on what court you're in, it can change and the case law can change. But, I mean, for example, in the BP Transocean Macondo um, oil blowout that I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, that jackup rig is considered a vessel and is governed by admiralty and maritime law. And that's because uh, the jackup rig floats and it's capable of transportation on water. Now there's actually a little bit of uncertainty happening right now. We have, we're seeing some platforms that used to be treated as vessels starting to be treated not as vessels and this could change. But um, one of the reasons we get money when we're lawyers is because there are these unsettled areas of the law and we have to fight over what things do and don't mean. So that's the sort of really basic parameters. Um, and Royston Razor, which is the place I work, is one of the oldest law firms in Texas. We were starting Galveston in 1892 when Galveston was the center of commerce in the Gulf region. It was actually the largest port um, between, I think, San Francisco and New York and um, was one of the most robust trading centers in the United States. And that all changed in 1900. There was a big hurricane, and Houston started to build and become the port that we know it is today. And actually, Royston started uh, an office there in 1920 and grew that until it became sort of the major um, office that it is now. Our work includes representation of P&I clubs, which I'm going to explain to you a little bit more in a minute. And um, we also done a lot of work for offshore oil companies and drilling contractors, um, American and foreign carriers and shipping lines around the world, American um, Eagle Tankers, AET, uh, TK Shipping, to just name a few. And we also do a lot of general civil commercial disputes as well. We've done a lot of work that's sort of peripheral to the maritime industry that have uh, a maritime connection. <coughs> Um, we actually have done a good deal of trucking work. You'll, you'll hear a little bit later from, from Todd that there is a, an entire supply chain that connects to the maritime industry that's very important. It's not just enough to get the, the product to the port. You've got to get it to its final destination. And so we've ended up having a lot of work related to that, pipeline work, offshore refinery work, and other civil and commercial disputes as well. So what is protection and indemnity? Um, we do a lot of work as P&I lawyers, our correspondents for P&I clubs, <clears throat> and it's the kind of mutual insurance, it's one of the sort of oldest insurances you would uh, uh, know about. It goes back to um, Roman times, actually, and it's a pay-to-be-paid kind of insurance where they actually create um, a sort of a group of members um, instead of paying a premium, they have a call, which each member pays based on their uh, risk, and then they make claims out of their pooled money. And if they end up having more claims and they have money in the pool, there'll be a second call, because you actually pay for the insurance that you're getting. It covers a broad kind of indeterminate risk, cargo damage, personal injury, collisions, stowaways. I had a very interesting stowaway case, not not too many years ago, pollution, and he and I correspond to the United States are mostly lawyers, although worldwide they're mostly non-lawyers. And so I'm going to show you just a little clip, <coughs> which hopefully will give you a little bit more of an idea, hopefully you can hear this, of what? Your bags completely lost. Thank you. 
to scrape, there's some damage to the vessel, and that's it. But you could be talking about complete loss of the vessel, completely blocking the port, causing tens of millions of dollars worth of pollution. The ship is out of service for many months. The consequential losses for a man can be very severe. And that's to say nothing about the risk of loss of life, personal injury. Mm -hmm. A collision is a very horrific experience, especially the bad collisions. We've seen collisions wipe out entire ships, their cargo, their crews, and cause wide-scale pollution. There have been several incidences in, around the world where uh, masters and officers have been blocked up or at least detained. Because you have to have the authorities' approval before they are allowed to go. So uh, if they don't give that approval, they might be there a very long time. The master or the navigation officer is endlessly asking himself the question, what if, only if I've done this. another vessel I have work and if uh, everybody is completely safe I don't have any work because unfortunately I get called when something goes wrong since our firm just does litigation work we don't do transactional work we, we don't we well we do very little transactional work I should say I do do some um, we're called when something has gone very very wrong um, it's not necessarily always a collision but that is part of what we handle. Um, as P&I correspondents, we're both legal counsel for the ship owner. We're hired by the club to represent the owner of the vessel in the case, um, but we also investigate the case. It's very important when there's a major incident that counsel is on board very, very shortly after the incident to make sure that evidence is preserved and captured so that once uh, all our witnesses have left, the jurisdiction, we have that information preserved for the litigation between the parties. We also assist in marine emergency response and we have to spill correspondence. Um, we have done this, for example, in one of the most, the largest, uh, most recent oil spills in Texas was uh, the Eagle Atome in Port Arthur, which was completely uh, overshadowed by the BP and, and fell out of, um, out of the, the public awareness but prior to that and it's still ongoing matter actually we're still working on it 
Uh, we, we represent ABT and we handled both the investigation, the NTSB investigation, the Coast Guard hearings, as well as we handled all the claims related to the case. And it was, it was a big one. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the incident, and it was a collision, uh, breached both hulls. It was a double hull, but it breached both hulls. And so the cargo spilled into the waterway and um, it, there was a lot of oil. Uh, and it was a pretty major cleanup, and um, uh, it it uh, has been a very expensive case for a lot of people. So um, I'll also, if I if I end up having time at the end, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of sort of interesting stories about some cases I've had. But um, I'm kind of trying to follow the format that I was given of things I'm supposed to cover. So I'll talk a little bit about benefits of career as a maritime lawyer. Oh, there's a typo. Um, interesting and diverse field of law and you know we, we do uh, a lot of different types of cases one case is never similar to the next um, if you like to do critical thinking of complex issues then it would be a good area for you but it like every field area of the law it requires um, uh, attention to detail and um, a certain kind of um, ability to focus on academic opinions and so forth that you might not find in other areas. Um, the compensation is, is very good. It uh, often involves international travel. We have clients in, in Norway, uh, in Dubai, in China, in Greece. Um, I just came back from a trip to London meeting with the P&I clubs, as you can probably tell from that little, little video. A lot of the P&I clubs are in London, and so um, we went and visited with them. And it's a very specialized area with a lot of growth potential, especially as we see uh, new regulations coming in for oil pollution and environmental regulations that we didn't see in the past. Uh, how you become a maritime lawyer? Well, you're going to need a first. The very first step is finishing high school uh, with good grades and good test scores, so you can get into a good college. Then you're going to need a four-year undergraduate degree. Any major is okay. Uh, matter of fact, um, my undergraduate degree is not what you would consider um, traditional, but I have an undergraduate degree in theater from NYU. And um, prior to going back to school to become a lawyer, I was an actor for a number of years in New York. So uh, it's not necessarily, there isn't necessarily a, a very simple, straightforward, linear path. Um, you obviously have to go to, to law school. And my advice to anyone who is thinking about law school is to aim high. Get into the very best school you can. Um, unfortunately, where you go to school does matter. And, um, and when, law, when law firms are recruiting, there are certain law, uh, law schools they recruit from and certain law schools that they don't recruit from. So <clears throat> do your best and get into the best school. You'll have to take the LSAT. And then the other areas, you know, are experience and training. I came into the maritime field sort of by chance. Um, I don't have, prior to starting my um, practice as a lawyer at Royston Razor, I didn't have any maritime experience. I didn't know much about anything about ships. I couldn't have told you, told you the difference between the pointy end and the other part at the other end and what they were called and how it worked or anything related to anything. And, uh, you know, and I've learned it on the job. And unfortunately, that's been, been hard. And some people come to it either with a background in the Coast Guard, um, a background as a Master Mariner, or some other um, maritime experience, but it's not necessarily a requirement. And there's also uh, some schools in the United States, Tulane um, being the one that I can think of off the top of, my end, top of my head, where you can get an LLM degree, which is sort of the advanced legal degree on top of your three years at law school. That's, specifically in maritime law. So, I see that's it for the presentation. I think I have maybe five minutes left, right? Five minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna just tell one quick story before I open it up for questions. One of the cases when I, when I talk to um, different classes, and I, and I do that, I do it every now and again, 
that I like to talk about is, I think it sort of just illustrates some of the issues, the different issues, is a case that I had some years ago related to a stowaways on board a vessel. And uh, the vessel was um, flagged in it was, uh, the Dominican Republic, no, the Philippines. Um, the stowaways were from the Dominican Republic. The master was from China, and his crew was from Korea, and the vessel was open, owned by a Japanese company. Okay. And so the, the ship was in the shipyard, in the port, in the Dominican Republic, and what I learned when I was working on the case that it's actually a pastime of young men there to go to the port and kind of see if they might be able to spot a vessel that looks like it's going to the U.S., but they don't have a guard posted on board. So there was a group of young men and they spotted this vessel and it was, I don't know how they knew it, but they figured out that it was headed for the U.S. There was no guard on board, so they snuck on board. They found a hold that didn't have, wasn't filled with cargo and they sort of set up camp inside. Matter of fact, there was, there was five of them. They realized that there wasn't room, so they drew straws to see who could stay, and four of them won. Um, realized they didn't have any supplies with them, so they snuck off the vessel, snuck back on the vessel with you know, some crackers and a few bottles of water and so forth and so on, and then the vessel set sail. Well, they're about three and a half, four days into the trip, they're in international waters on the open sea at this point. They've run out of crackers. They've run out of water. The hold isn't smelling very good anymore for reasons you could probably guess. And uh, they've decided to throw themselves on the mercy of the crew. And they wait until about 5 a.m. And the sun has not even come up yet. It's sort of dark and there's fog over the ship, but there's only a skeleton crew, and they come up out of the hold, and the crew that's on board, you know, freaks out, doesn't know what to do, and, you know, these people just appear out of the hold, and they, their compensation is partially a bonus system, and if they don't have a guard on board, and they let stowaways sneak on, and when that vessel comes to the United States, that vessel's gonna be hit with penalties, but in the United States, they lose their bonus. Master's asleep, so the crew decides to put the stowaways overboard. <laughs> they make them build rafts from the dunnage on the, the deck, you know, like sort of the broken up wood and so forth. Make a raft, they let them build a raft, and put the raft overboard, and they tell them to go over the side and get on the raft. Um, two of them actually just get right off. They, you know, they go down the ladder and they get on the raft. One of them actually, I think, manages to swim. And one of them just begs them to please not make him go over. He doesn't know how to swim. He never makes it to the raft. And I think the crew is probably counting on them never making it to the United States. Miracle of miracles, the raft makes it. To the United States. And when they hit shore, I don't know where it was exactly, they're, you know, picked up by the Coast Guard and they tell the Coast Guard the story of what happened and what the vessel looked like and so forth and so on. When the vessel hits port, the Coast Guard boards and said, Did you have stowaways on board? Oh, no, 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 no stowaways on board. And the stowaways have described the inside of the hold, they've drawn a picture on the inside of the hold. They you know, do uh, an investigation, they find the hole, they find the empty cracker, you know, cellophane, the, the bottles that had water that now have urine inside, et cetera, et cetera. The drawing on the side, and they go, okay, yeah, this is the, this is the vessel. Master gets arrested, second mate gets arrested. They both get sent back, and I'm not sure if it was the flag country or the country that the, the, the young men were from. They're both in prison. And the family of the young man who died sues the vessel owner for what the crew did. And which, of course, the vessel owner has a policy that if there's stowaways aboard, you're supposed to put them in you know, a cabin and give them food and water until they get to the United States. But that's not what they did. And so, and we represented the vessel owner. 
Now, I'm, that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything more about the case. I could, maybe, but I'm going to open it up for questions and then see with that cliffhanger if anybody is going to be willing to raise their hands and ask any questions. <laughs> we got two whole more, two whole minutes. So what happened? Yeah. <laughs> then, at least one person got their hand up. <laughs> well, um, we we argued that um, there was no personal jurisdiction over the owner. The vessel had been chartered. The charterer, you know, charter. Do, does everybody know what a charter is? So if somebody wants to use your vessel, they basically come up with a rental type of agreement where they're going to use your vessel for a certain period of time, either on a time basis or like, you know, I want to take it from here to here, right, on a voyage basis. And so the charterer had come to the United States a bunch of times, but the owner had never been to the United States, didn't do business here, had no connections to the United States, and one of the requirements to be called into any court is you have to have personal jurisdiction. And we argued there was no personal jurisdiction, and we won. Okay. Now, uh, and then, you know, this is also my little plug. I was, you know, I came into this thinking that the plaintiff's lawyers, the people who sued the other people were the guys in the white hats, and the defense lawyers were the very, very bad people what I do for the very, very bad people. <laughs> and um, I have changed my opinion um, in, in, in recent years. And I will say this, uh, I, we had a very generous settlement offer on the table that um, they declined to take. And I've seen that on a number of occasions where the plaintiff's lawyer makes promises that they can't keep and they, they build expectations up for their clients so that they have a pie in the sky idea that they're gonna um, retire rich off of this case and so when uh, an offer of a couple hundred thousand dollars or maybe even half a million dollars is on the table and they think they're going to get millions and millions and millions um, is on the table and they walk away from that money and then they get they get nothing so and it went up to the fifth circuit we also won the appeal they sought cert from the united states supreme court we opposed certification um, to the supreme court and it was denied service tonight. Any other questions? <laughs> yes? Where did you attend law school at? Uh, UT. Yeah, I went to, I, like I said, I went to NYU undergrad and then UT and there was a long break in between. I graduated undergrad in 91 and then um, I started law school in 2003, graduated in 2006. So, and, and how long the partnership? I'm a partner in five years. That's probably pretty quick. Is it? It's a record at my firm. It's the first time anyone in my law firm since 1892 has made a partner in five years. Congratulations. I'm a little proud of it. I guess. Any other questions? All right, well, I'm not going to take up all the night. I'm going to turn it over to, to Mr. Stewart and turn it back over to Dr. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Woo! And if you guys, if someone has some, too shy to raise their hand, but they do have a question later on, um, uh, Diane will have my contact information. Feel free to send me an email. Thank you so much. Yeah, what did I tell you? <laughs> and you will be successful. Look how successful she is. So this was really a great opportunity. And so thank you very much, Rachel. And now she's going to go home shortly and take care of her two little boys, right? So yes. she may not be here at the end, but I will have her contact information. So now I want to introduce to you our second speaker. And again, this is such an incredible opportunity. Todd Stewart is the president of Gulf Winds International. He actually started with the company working in the warehouses doing all the all the what do you call the machine uh, cheap labor cheap labor he calls it cheap labor he's going to tell you the whole story but it slipped my mind back up no what anyway he was moving all the stuff around barkley up i couldn't think of word he was moving all the stuff around uh, yeah that's right anyway he's done everything at golf wins 
But in a very short period of time, he's now president of Gulf Winds International, which is a huge logistics firm, one of the largest in the whole region. He's going to tell you all about it. But I've got to tell you, he also has an incredible family. He has, he's, you can tell he's very young. He's so extremely successful. And his life is something that if you could follow Todd, Todd's life, not only his career path, but also the way he lives his life, his faith, and his leadership and generosity to so to so everybody around him, you would just have such an outstanding adventure every day. And his dad is also here, Steve Stewart, and Steve is the chairman of Gulf Winds International. They really built the company together. Todd went there immediately upon graduation from college, uh, Stephen F. Austin, and they, they really built the company together. But I want to tell you, it is an incredible company. Everyone that works there will tell you the same thing. If you could ever get a job at Gulf Winds International, you'd never, ever want to leave. There's no question about that. So listen very carefully to everything Todd tells you and try to talk to him at the end and see if you can't get you a career lined up. And he may even get Steve to give you some uh, tidbits of information as they go through as they go along so this is going to be an incredible time enjoy it take notes don't forget anything it is being videoed and we will have it on the website okay yes okay so can y'all hear me in the back so how do you how do you follow uh, you know a girl who went to law school after being an actress right and sets records every day one of the things that uh, ways that I do this, the other thing she didn't tell you too, which I'll brag on her about as well, is, is her children are adopted. And she went through a very long process to get that done a couple years ago. And it has been unbelievable with that tenacity that you see in her. Uh, when she had her, her arms on those kids, they weren't getting away. So she followed that through to its logical end. And the Lord blessed them with uh, a family. So it's just a great blessing to be here with, with Rachel. And what a joy to listen to her speak. But I do want to include my dad in this presentation. I'm going to ask him to get up here with me. He didn't, he didn't even know he was going to do this today. But I'm going to get him up with me today. So yeah, we, we have to know that. All right. We have been able to listen, I promise. We have been very blessed in amazing ways in our company. And we did. We started in 1996. Uh, basically, I was cheap labor right out of college. Uh, but I really want to get my dad up here for a number of reasons. Number one, just because I love and respect him. But number two, I think there's some things that we can learn from two sides of our business. For 25 years, my dad spent his time actually working for steamship companies. So he was actually responsible for booking uh, cargo onto those vessels. And so I think we can learn a little bit briefly just about his background and what led him into the field of being in the maritime working for steamship companies. And then I can tie that to what our company does today, which is basically supporting the land side transportation, distribution and storage of the goods that come off of those vessels. So in essence, we can give you both sides of the equation. And then of course, you've already heard from the lawyer who can help you if you need help there. So I'll turn it over to my dad to kind of give you a brief history on his background and what got him into the maritime industry. And then we'll, we'll talk further about what we do at Gulf Winds. Well, thank you. I, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit interesting because uh, it, coming from my generation, uh, the shipping business, a little bit kind of like Rachel's story, she kind of got into maritime law kind of through a, through a back door, really. And that's what kind of happened to me. I, uh, I was in the U.S. Navy and um, had not finished my education yet. I'd gone to a couple of years of college and uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. So I joined the Navy to see the world and, and uh, basically grew up. I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I went to sea, and, and uh, I love the sea, I like the ships, and I, I made a very good friend uh, in those years who uh, got out before I did, his enlistment uh, was up before I did, and he went to work for a company called Sealand Service. And Sealand Service, and I'm going back to the early, uh, this was in the 60s and early 70s, Sealand Service in those days was an American flag company and was the premier uh, container shipping company uh, in, uh, in America and in fact probably in the world and the owner of, of Sealand was a guy by the name of Malcolm McLean and if any of you have been studying containerization you'll know that Malcolm McLean is considered to be the father of containerization and that's those that's those boxes that you see on chassis and on the ships that you see called container ships well he invented those and uh, uh, funny enough 
Uh, it all happened right here in Houston, Texas in about 1956 when he started developing that, uh, that concept. Uh, he loaded those containers on a freight bulk vessel uh, bound from here to, uh, to New Jersey in 1956. And that's what started the containerization, uh, uh, the movement of containerization from brake bulk shipping into what we now know today, what dominates the world shipping today is, is, is these containers. But my friend went to work for Sealand, and of course we stayed in touch, and uh, I got out and I went back to school. And in my day, <clears throat> we didn't have, uh, like you have, many of you are here probably from UH or maybe San Jack or uh, ACC, I'm not sure what all I know is <coughs> UH folks here. Uh, there really wasn't, there weren't any, there weren't any transportation educational programs. Uh, you just didn't hear about it. Most people, a little bit like Rachel, got into the maritime business. Either you came out of the Navy or you came out of the Coast Guard uh, or you came out of the labor unions and you just kind of somehow just maybe just kind of stumbled into it as a career opportunity. And that's what kind of happened to me. My friend happened to do the same thing. He didn't, he was, he just, he got a, a lead to, 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 uh, to, uh, to join or to interview with Sealand. He got hired and we stayed in touch while I was still in the Navy. And he, he was telling me about this great company he worked for. And he said, Steve, you can't believe it. He says, man, he said, I'm traveling to Puerto Rico. I'm here. I got, I got this expense account. And I mean, I am entertaining and I'm getting paid. And he said, you got to look into this. This is a great career opportunity. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with that? So, uh, so I got my degree. <laughs> I got my degree. And, uh, and Alan, bless his heart, uh, unfortunately, my friend passed away many, many years ago to an illness. And, and uh, uh, was a sad part of that uh, story. But, but uh, Alan was true to his word. Alan, uh, Alan got me an interview with uh, Sealand, and it was here in Houston. I graduated from Lamar University over in Bowman, and I drove over here to Houston. And I interviewed with the local uh, port captain. They were called port captain in those days, and I think they still use that term a lot. Uh, his name was Bob Berry, and uh, Bob, of course, is, he's going on too at this point in time. But, um, but I was lucky. I, I, I had a good interview. Uh, Bob liked the fact that I had military background, and and I was a little older than most college graduates and had my degree. I had my degree in business. I didn't have transportation. There was no such thing as a transportation degree at Lamar, or for that matter, any other schools that I knew of at that time. So um, Bob said, you know what? He said, uh, I'm going to do you, I, I want you to go to, to New Jersey to our corporate headquarters, and I want you to interview. I'm going I'm to recommend that you interview for our management training program. And I'm okay with that. I just want a job. I mean, I, I want to go work. Uh, I've had four years of school and four years of the Navy, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of falling behind. I got to get to work and start making a living. And um, so I go to New Jersey, and I was fortunate enough to get accepted in the management training program. And in those days, Sealand had what was the premier training program for people coming into the maritime field because there weren't any schools. They, we had to train our own. People like me and uh, like Rachel coming on board, we had to learn on the job, so to speak. And they had a very rigorous program where you'd come into the program and you'd be formed out somewhere around the country to a terminal. You'd report to that terminal manager and it was a study course. You had your books and your assignments and your written courses work, but you also worked during the day and you'd be assigned uh, uh, over usually about a six month to about a nine month to maybe a year uh, on the job training with your little books that you had to learn and every Friday you had to go before the terminal manager and present what you had done that week and what you had learned and turn in your paperwork and he really held your career in his hands. I mean he was life or death for your career and I trained in Seattle and uh, fortunately enough, fortunately I, I did well and uh, when my tour was up, I got sent back to New Jersey to the headquarters and you go back into the pool and you have to start all over again and interview for a job someplace. Well, that's how my career started. I started out in container shipping, really kind of by accident, kind of a backdoor way because there was no transportation programs. And so for the next 25 years, I spent my life uh, in the container shipping business, got to see the world. Uh, lived all over the U.S., traveled internationally, have lived overseas some. Uh, so uh, to Rachel's point, it's also a good way to see the world. And, uh, and uh, that's how I got into shipping. And, uh, but I had an opportunity, and this is where I'll give it back to Todd, uh, <clears throat> about 1994, I guess, I was, well, just prior to that, I was in England. I was the managing director of a 
Dutch shipping line over in uh, uh, Europe, based in uh, based in England, and it was a Dutch company, Dutch container company, and, and as you heard from, from Rachel, these companies are all they're all over the world. I mean, they're not, it truly is a global uh, a global industry. They were having talked with a company called PO, Peninsula and Orient, and that was a, that was an English company, and they were talking having merger talks. And uh, when I was in the UK, I got transferred. Those talks were taking back. I got transferred back to the UK, uh, back to back to the corporate in uh, in uh, in the US. And sure enough, those 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 uh, those talks took place. And uh, guess what? <laughs> I ended up losing my job. I got laid off. And. Uh, I've got 25 years under my belt, and now I have some other opportunities. But it, but it's a it's a real uh, it's a real shock to get laid off. when at this point in time, I'm about 50 years old now, okay, and and uh, and I've got this guy to, to get through college still, and uh, and, I don't think that would be that right. and uh, so uh, I decided I I had some really good friends in the business. The one thing about the international shipping is is that. And I think this is, to me, is probably the best, is that the people you meet, you're going to work with and you will meet people from all over the world. You will make friends from all nationalities. Uh, it's a hugely diverse industry, people of all nationalities. I can pick up the phone or I can land in London or Dubai or, uh, or Singapore or Rotterdam and I know people there that I can call and I can go and have a place to stay that night. I mean, I have friends all over the world. Uh, that probably is, a, is, is one of the most exciting things about, to me, about being in the global shipping is, the, is that global network and that group of, of the people that you'll get to, to meet and to work with and they will be lifelong friends. Uh, shipping people stick together. It's a it's a it's a big global industry, but it's very small in a lot of ways. Uh, friendships last forever, and uh, uh, so anyway, I, I I put to use some of those friendships and some of those relationships, and came back to Texas and uh, started my company, uh, started a, a little sh shipping agency and uh, Stern International, and uh, that, over a short period of time, morphed into what is today Gulf Winds International, which is a full service, what we call a third-party logistics company, and those of you who are studying transportation, I'm sure know, know what that is, and Todd can tell you a little bit more about that. But that's how, that's my background, that's how I got started, and we opened our company in 1990, Gulf Winds in 1996. Uh, Todd did come on board, uh, he graduated from Stephen F. Austin, like me, with a business degree. I honestly tried to talk him out of it. Uh, I love the shipping industry uh, and, and certainly didn't have a problem with them doing it. And I've told people many, many times, if I had to do it all over again today, I'd do the same thing again. I would not hesitate, wouldn't even, wouldn't even think twice about going back into shipping because it's a great way to make a living. Probably won't get rich, but you'll make a good living. Uh, you can raise your family, you'll see the world in most cases, make a lot of friends, so I'd probably do it all over again. But I, didn't, uh, I was worried about Todd and his future because, you know, as, as, as you know, or if you don't know, most startup businesses don't make it. It just doesn't happen. Most businesses fail, and they fail because they're underfunded or lots of, lots of reasons. But the facts are, and I don't know the statistics today, uh, I've about something like 95% of new business ventures just don't make it. And um, I took a chance, and I did all the wrong things that they will tell you to do. I used my savings, I used my 401k money, I used IRA money. I did everything I could to, to find money to, to put into my company to, to get it started and funded for the first two or three years. I didn't draw a salary. Uh, my wife had retired. She went back to work as a nurse to, uh, to make some extra money and provide, to provide us insurance. And that's, that's kind of how we did it. I graduated uh, 1996, just after we opened, and I tried to talk him out of it because I was afraid that we may not make it, and I didn't want him to be caught up in that. My idea was, you go to work for a big corporation somewhere, get some experience. If we make it, then you come over and bring us that experience that you learned in another company, because we could probably use that. But he was he was bent on being part of the ground up, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he did, and he's been a part of the operation since we started. He's probably done every job in the company. I have a picture of him on his first day of work uh, in a pair of shorts, a sack lunch, 
And I think he may have his diploma, I'm not sure, but he's going to work with a, with a college degree, making all $5 an hour driving a forklift. That's how he started. And sometimes that's what you have to do, okay? Sometimes that's what you have to do. Don't think you're gonna start at the top. You, you really, you know, uh, even me, I was sweeping the warehouses and knocking down the cobwebs out of the, out of the warehouse ceilings, and you do whatever you gotta do when you go into your own business. We call it surfing the web. Yeah. The web was brand new back then. Yeah. <laughs> you make it fun. So that's how we started, and uh, Todd has done every job, and uh, we moved on. We have been in business now for over 17 years. We have become a, a pretty dominant player in the 3PL market. Uh, we have customers that are the Home Depots of the world, the Walmarts, the Pier Ones, the, the big chemical companies. I mean, we have just about every major company that you can think of is, is a customer buyer. So, so we've been blessed, as Todd said, we've done very well. And then last year, uh, I stepped, not stepped aside, but I stepped back a little bit, turned the company over to Todd, because in our company, the president is the principal executive officer, and running the company falls to the office of president. So I'm now more of an advisor, strategic, uh, looking for strategic opportunities for us and playing a, a more, more of a role on the political side of, of the industry and working with associations that benefit our, our industry and I'll leave the rest of it now to you. So how do you follow Rachel? <laughs> Thanks Dan, I appreciate that. Uh, it has been a great story and it is an awesome story. I love telling it because people say you know, when you talk about starting a business with your 401k, it's an amazing story, really. And we were one month from going broke, and I remember, literally, I remember that month. I remember uh, that December, and we made it through that January, praise God, and from there, we've just grown. And we've had dramatic growth, and it's been a real growth experience for me personally. Uh, as my dad said, uh, just, you know, you do have to be willing to do things that you might not want to do. You know, that one of the things that we noticed, and I talked to a lot of students about, is you know i remember going to lunch or making uh, 250 dollars a week and i remember taking my sack lunch and of course you know i got to work kind of with my dad some so that was a, that was a bonus but i do remember doing that and i remember my other option was to go to work for general motors and praise god i didn't go to work for general motors right <laughs> so you really look back on your life and you see how things are guided but uh, at the time i had a friend who had his dad had had entry into the into that uh that place which basically was a management training program and so I chose to go this route and I'm really grateful that I did obviously for a number of reasons but we have such an opportunity and I want to share a quick story with you guys uh, out of Luke 15 it's a story you know, how many of y'all heard the story of the prodigal son probably most people have heard it but I'm going to tell you the story for a number of reasons first of all there was a there was a guy and uh, he had lots of money and he had a couple of sons and one of the sons decided, Dad, I want that money now. And basically what happened is uh, in those days, obviously that was kind of a slap in the face, if you will. But the dad loved the son and said, Son, if you want the money now, I'm going to give it to you. So he gives the money to the son. The son takes the money and goes off and parties and does all those things and loses all of the money. So the son wakes up and the son is now working for a foreigner and he's feeding pigs for a living. Okay? So he's blown all of that inheritance that he could have had, right? So he wakes up one day and he says, man, the servants for my dad have it better than I had it because I chose to take mine now and run away and try and do things on my own, right? And so one day he says, okay, I gotta get out of here. I'm going back home. So he goes back expecting that his father's gonna beat him when he gets home and probably his brothers too. And as he's approaching the house, his father comes out and he sees him and his father begins to run to his son. And his father embraces his son and says, basically, son, you know, once you were lost, but now you're found and we're gonna celebrate. And he tells the family to go slaughter a, 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 a lamb and they're gonna bring him in and they're gonna have a big feast and they're gonna have a great party because there's a reunion now, because the family is back together. And what a joy, right, to see a father's love bringing a son home. And so, again, a few meanings out of this for me today. First of all, the joy to be able to work with my dad, knowing I haven't done everything right all along, but yet, you know, a lot of times your family receives you. And so that was a joy. But for you guys, there's a lesson in that. For all of us, there's a lesson. Today, we live in a society where everybody wants everything right now, right? 
And so for me, I've been working 17 years now, which I still think, I can't believe it. I wake up and I think about that day and I had all brown hair when I went to work, right? <laughs> so now I have a 13 year old and boom, all of a sudden it goes by quickly. But the point is, is you do have to be willing to learn. You, you heard Rachel talk about early how, you know, she didn't know anything about vessels, but yet she had to learn it, right? So for me, if I, wanna, if I wanted to be able to, to talk and work and be able to direct and, and for people to give you a respect level, then you have to be willing to work side by side with them. People from all races, all nationalities, all backgrounds across the board, right? So, I mean, I serve in the warehouse a lot of times. I've got guys that still work with us that I worked with outside of the warehouse when I was 16 years old in high school. And so it's really amazing for me today to have those relationships with guys that know and respect because you've been able to go grow up with them, if you will. And so I just want to encourage you guys to, to know that, yes, there are some years that you do have to put in some work, but if you have a career path and you are committed to it, that there's such opportunity in this industry, okay? The other thing that I learned out of that story is this, and that is it always seems like the grass is greener on the other side, right? How many times, right, the relationship, whatever it is, all you guys, all you girls can tell stories about it, right? And then you wake up and go, what was I thinking, right? Well, that's kind of that can be the same, right, for, for careers as well, right? And so you don't just want to be like this job hopper all the time, right? You need to get your feet in somewhere and you've got to get some experience in order to move along. So it's critically important that, that you're willing to do that individually and that you don't take the entitlement mentality, if you will, that, hey, i got to have it today. Because there's obviously a lot of people out there that need work, but here's the beauty of that story too. This son thought going on the other side to the greener pasture was gonna, was gonna be great, right? But what he found is when he came right back home, that's where the opportunity was. So here's what I wanna tell you guys. Houston, Texas is by far right now the best place that you could be in the country to gain a job. So all of you that are in this place, I mean, you should feel so grateful that this is where you are. Every day, I can't tell you how many presentations and, and people that I've talked to from around the country, people that we do business with, they look at Houston and go, wow, it's amazing what's happening down in Houston. Even during the recession, we did great. And so we, we lost a little bit of business in the process, but our business still continued to grow. So the opportunity for those who are willing to work and do those things is really, really great right here in Houston, Texas. One of the neat opportunities that you have here is we have such a diverse economy in Houston. You've got the petrochemical companies. I mean, think about the reality of this. You've got Dow Chemical, Chevron, Exxon, all of these companies building massive plants that are going to produce amazing amounts of product that's going to be exported. All of that stuff has to be handled by somebody in the logistics chain, right? The steamship companies, the warehouse providers, the trucking companies. So all of that growth in the petrochemical area is going to push growth in our region and there has to be jobs to fill those voids. And so there's going to be opportunities on the petrochemical side. We do business with a lot of the oil field companies and all the oil field service companies. All of you probably read about all the fracking that's taking place all over the country. We ship product through our warehouse facilities every day that goes all the way up to North Dakota through Houston, Texas. And so all the support and the, and the things that go in, the products and the different service offerings that go into drilling, all of that stuff comes through Houston, Texas. One of the big, uh, uh, one of the big Mexican oil companies, Pemex, the national oil company, they're, they're moving their entire procurement office to Houston, Texas because they view Houston as the center of the world when it comes to oil. Same with the petrochemical folks. And so all of you have a great opportunity. Those are just two. The retailers are, are here. We've got Home Depot and other people who are building facilities or already have existing facilities. So we have a very diverse customer base. What's awesome about it is you've got both imports and exports in Houston. So it's a great balance, which breeds a really nice economy. And so consequently, there's got to be a lot of jobs to support that. I don't know what you guys are studying individually, but you know we're just we're one piece of the puzzle. When I look at the logistics chain, the way I described it is it's like the circulatory system, right? You've got to move blood to every part of your body, right? But you've got veins that do that, and so you got right, you got oceans, you got trucks, you got all this stuff. But when there's a clog in the chain, 
right? Then you got a problem. You got to go to the doctor, right? So our job in logistics is to keep that flow moving so that the freight gets to where it needs to go and the consumers, you guys and us, that when we're at home or shopping at Walmart, right? We want that product to be on the shelf. And so that's kind of the, that's how it works globally. And that's really when you look at where do I fit in, there's a lot of different places that you can fit in. Right? You don't have to be in the warehousing and transportation business, although it's been very good to us. There's also a customs house brokerage. There's the freight forwarding. There's the steamship companies. So it's a really broad scope. And, and a lot of times you can take a person from one place and they can gain experience in, let's say they worked in our area, and then they may go work for an oil company or somebody in their logistics chain. So many times you go to work for a service provider, and then you can go to work for maybe a retailer, or you can go to work for one of these oil companies or a petrochemical company. Because one of the beautiful things that's happened, and one of the great things about what you're studying is every board of directors today now takes supply chain into, into account. Years ago, the logistics and supply chain weren't even looked at. But today, it's such a huge cost center and, and costs that are so important to everybody that they've realized that's the one opportunity we have to outpace our competition. So guess who's setting the, the pace for global, when you look at delivering freight, who do you think of when you think, I'm going to get your freight to you the next day? FedEx, UPS. FedEx, UPS. How about one that starts with an A? Amazon, right? Amazon is literally revolutionizing the logistics business because they promise that you'll get the thing the next day. I mean, it's crazy for free. And so they're building all these distribution points in different areas. So everything's changing all the time. And so if you're looking for something that every day you go to work and there's something different to handle, it's a good opportunity for you to be in that field. Uh, I do want to tell you a little bit about kind of our company specifically. Uh, again, my dad was on the shipping side, but once that freight gets to the U.S., then you have to have people that will handle and distribute that product. That's what we do at our warehouse facility. So we operate about 2.2 million square feet of warehouse space. And basically when that product comes in on the ships, we have trucks that go down, they pick those things up like Legos, set it on the truck, bring it to our warehouse facility, or we deliver it inland to, the, to somebody. That could be anybody from Fossil to Home Depot to Container Store to uh, oil field service companies to petrochemical companies to uh, resin packagers, you name it. So across the board. But somebody has to move, store, and distribute that freight. When I was learning about logistics originally, it was described to me as this. Look, Todd, it's a bank. When you deposit your money, you want your money back, right? And so our job in inventory, keeping product, is managing that inventory for people so that that product stays in good condition and that we get it to where it needs to go on time, right? So that's, that's a little bit about, about what we do in the puzzle. Our customer base, though, it covers the gamut from every type of industry that I talked about earlier. So let me see if I can uh, play a little uh, thing for you guys to see. And then I'll close this.
Okay, so that gives you a little insight kind of into, into who we are. But our warehouse facilities are located adjacent to the port of Houston, right? AIB, <laughs> ICE Futures Certified Delivery Point for Exchange Coffee, Certified for Public Way, as a Certified Pest Control Program, as an approved customs exam station, and a CTPAC compliant. All of Gulfwind's trucks are individually permitted through the state of Texas to haul 5% over legal gross and 10% over legal axle weight. In addition, Gulfwind's also maintains a permit through Harris County that allows us to legally haul up to maximum container capacity between the Port of Houston's Barber's Cut and Bayport Container Terminals in our strategically located port warehouse facilities. These permits allow our customers to maximize inbound and outbound cargo weight, resulting in substantial ocean and land transportation savings opportunities. Contact our logistics professionals today to see why more companies are relying on Gulf Winds as their first choice in supply chain management solutions and services. So that's a little bit about us and kind of what we do and I wanted to give you from uh, my dad's perspective the steamship side because I think that's very important because we're just a piece of the puzzle and if you don't put it all together then you're missing a lot. So we are very fortunate, very blessed. I thank Diane for having us here tonight and just for you guys taking time out of your schedule to come and listen to what we have to say. But uh, it's an exciting career. There's a lot of opportunity with many different companies. Uh, there's certainly opportunities for many different types of people. At the end of the day, I know earlier Rachel talked about specific jobs, having specific needs and requirements. There's lots of different opportunities within the logistics field, whether you like material handling, whether you like the documentation side of things, whether you like drivers, I mean, it goes down the list. Uh, so I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have, but I just want to say thank you for coming. And uh, it's been a joy to visit with you. Some of you I've seen before, and uh, it's exciting to come out and, and see that there's this many people really interested in uh, what we're doing down by the port. Gulfwinds have a training program like you described about the other companies? We do, yes. We have a training program that uh, basically from, from the time you start. A big part of, uh, obviously a big part of training anywhere that you go to work in the logistics field is going to be on the job training. Uh, but we go through, a, we have a documented training program that we go through. We, we take you through to try and get you up on the basics, if you will. But part of that is sitting individually with different parts of the company because what you do in dispatch versus what you're doing managing a warehouse account will be totally different. A lot of it's linked, but it's different. And so we try and give you a little bit of every piece of the puzzle so then when you go to work, you kind of have a general knowledge of all of it. And that's how we approach it. Do you offer summer internships? We do. Uh, in fact, in uh, respect, we've worked with a couple of different schools uh, offering internships. And uh, we work with, even we work with a high school actually uh, that's uh, on the south side of town as well, uh, who has uh, students who are uh, basically uh, come from uh, very low income families uh, that they work while they're going to school and they pay for their college. And so that's been a joy to work with, uh, with them as well. Um, when you started the company, how many people were working there and how many are working there now? When we started the company, we basically had five people. Uh, we basically had three in the office and uh, myself and another gentleman outside. And uh, today we have about 185 employees, uh, but we also employ ILA labor. And so we probably have another 100 ILA folks. And then we have about 325 drivers that are owner operators. So we have terminals in Dallas and we have about 2.2 million square feet of warehouse space in Houston. About a million of that is located adjacent to the port. So there's two major container terminals in Houston, right? You guys are familiar with the port, Barber's Cut, and of course Bayport, which will ultimately be the largest container terminal on the Gulf. And so we have, we have facilities adjacent to both of those terminals, obviously strategically placed to try and grow with the imports and the exports. I also, too, just, just particularly for UH folks, uh, we have uh, 
I happen to serve on the advisory uh, board to the University of Houston College of Technology, and that that college oversees the the Center for Logistics and Transportation Policy, which is an ongoing uh, professional training program for people who already at work and got their degrees. It also includes the uh, undergraduate supply chain program and the master's program. Gulfwest is uniquely positioned to handle all of your transloading needs with warehousing facilities located adjacent to the port of Houston. <laughs> and we have uh, we have some UH grads. We have some uh, some employees that are going to UH uh, at night or our, our extra courses. But we also work very closely with Sanjack with HCC. Uh, I worked closely with Diane when she was the president of the East End Chamber, and one of the things I'm really proud of is that during Diane's tenure there, and when I was chairman of the East End Chamber, we actually, in cooperation with the ILA, the pilots, the Port of Houston, Houston Independent School District, we, uh, did I leave anybody? Well, the other school districts did not. Well, primarily yeah. it started. Right. We instituted a program in the high schools, initially at, it was in Yates, Austin, Austin right? Are you talking about for the engineering? The maritime, no, no, the Maritime. The maritime it was at Austin 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 Nates. Uh, a Maritime Academy program where we set up a curriculum for high school students to start learning about maritime and transportation at the high school level where they could gain credits for upon graduation, uh, depending on the program, where they could go immediately into some sort of uh, maritime field probably towards the lower end, working for, let's say, barge lines or things like that, which, by the way, is still a very good job, pays very well. Uh, or they could take those credits to a, a two-year program, uh, and, and we're like Sanjack or ACC has, a, has maritime programs at, on an associate degree level, or take it on to a four-year program. So we're really, we're really, I'm really proud. We're really proud about that program. That has grown now to several high schools. Uh, it's in report now, and we are seeing that the, the fruits of that. Those kids are graduating now and moving on through. And we intern many of them. If we watch some of them now go off to college, and that's right, and they're getting their studying their degrees in college. So uh, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. So if you have questions, I mean, we're I'm, like I said, I'm on the advisory board. And uh, get in touch with Diane, and, and we're happy to. Uh, I love um, I love this industry. It's been good to me and my family, and uh, we're dedicated to trying to give back as much as we can to that to that uh, educational process to help other people enjoy what we what we've had. Let me let me add one thing too. I want I think something that I wanted to share with you guys. Something that I've seen as far as a trend in the industry that I think would be beneficial to you guys. One of the really neat things that's happened in my career, and again, I've been doing it for 17 years, and so you guys got to remember, as much as I feel like I should be like right where you are right now, but then I look and I see I have a lot of gray hair, and I wake up and go, wow, when did that happen? But when I went into the industry, our business was primarily run by what I would call a logistician, and these were people who knew a little bit of everything about logistics, okay? They were extremely detailed in every area, but you had to learn every discipline and learn it well. The shift that I've witnessed in the last 15 years, obviously brought on by literally the internet, computer, everything has drastically changed in the supply chain. Everything today, when I look at the big companies and what they're looking for, and we deal with a lot of these people, is they've gone away from obviously the logisticians and what they're hiring now is data analysts to start. And so those skills, those analytical skills, have really become extremely important in our business. Everything today is measured. In fact, we have a tool, a proprietary tool that we developed in-house that we call, it's a container management tool called GWI Track, where we track containers from the time they're loaded on the vessel all the way through uh, the time that they're delivered. And so, People want to know where their product is throughout the supply chain, but each one of those legs in that supply chain can now be measured. Well, in the old days, there was no way to do that, but with the internet, there is. And so we've automated all that tracing. So we trace <coughs> with the ports, with the railroads, with the terminal operators, and we've basically been able to consolidate all of that onto one screen. So now you can, you can measure your business, you can make decisions based off of the data, 
Whereas in the old days, you'd have to make 10 or 15 phone calls to figure out where everything was. So we're able to do so much more today because of the technology. The first great invention, I remember when I first got into the business, was we could pick up an old telephone that you did one of these punch numbers on, and I would dial in the container number, and it would tell me if it was released or not, right? And that was an improvement. Before that, I had to make a call to the steamship company, and they had to tell me if it was released or not. So from there, it went to web-based automation, and then we automated that process. So what would take us now thousands of hours, our, computer, our computers just do it all day long. And so we can tell our customers at any given time where their freight is, and they can then track and measure each leg of their supply chain. And that becomes very, very important because all these customers, especially during the recession, a lot of them got caught with really high inventory levels. And so it was beneficial for us as a company because we go sell the fact that we can track that in the supply chain and that that will enable you to measure and keep track of what's there so you don't have to store it in a warehouse. In other words, let's put what's in the warehouse in the supply chain and that way we reduce our, our inventory costs. And so it's all become about how do we measure and manage the data, a lot more so, quite frankly, than the physical movement of the goods. And so I just want to encourage you guys, those analytical skills now are critically important to being successful in this business. But it's what's really, what's really awesome about it is you see a lot of young people, though, being promoted and lifted up the chain in a hurry because a lot of the logisticians don't have those analytical skills or the computer skills necessary to do that. And so I just want to encourage you, if that's something that certainly that you're very good at, then you need to capitalize on that because it's very big in our business today. How do we measure the business? Because then I can save money. And so if I can save somebody money, then I'm going to get the business. So even from a sales perspective, when we go visit with clients, we want to break down that supply chain so that we can provide a value to them. And then I don't have to charge what the next guy charges. I can charge him more because we can save them money somewhere else. Right, so that's how we've gotten our margins up and we've been able to run a business that's been you know, profitable over a long period of time, which you know, doesn't happen a lot when you look at the size of our business. So, uh, I just had one question regards, you mentioned how you measure the business. Uh, being in the business that you are, which is moving goods and services out of, in, out of and into international ports, my biggest concern is the Homeland Security issue. And is there an opportunity for people in this room to work within your company or externally to the Department of Homeland Security to monitor the goods and services that are coming in? What opportunities are there for people in this room to work in sort of a conjunction with your company and our, or in our U.S. government in terms of keeping goods and safe safe that are coming into our country? <coughs> Well, a lot of that will depend on how much money we spend, right? But, but there's absolutely a lot of job opportunities. I would say this, the ILA, we, we actually have gotten some of our folks on with the ILA, which is another career path that a lot of people, that some people have taken, in particular, a lot of the folks from the east side of town uh, that has been good. Yeah, the International Longshoremen Association. So these are the guys that control or unload the ships. And so they run the, they basically run the ports all over the U.S. So they're very powerful politically because if they stop moving, then all goods stop moving. So when you hear there's going to be a strike, which you heard last year, I don't know if y'all were involved in that. But of course, we were tracking it very, very closely because overnight our business stops and everything stops, our cash flow and all that stuff that goes along with it. So, you know, it was, it was critically important to us. But the ILA, uh, they create a lot of jobs. We actually work with them. We employ a lot of ILA employees. Uh, but they have great wage scales, uh, especially starting off and if you're willing to stick with it and move on. A lot of people make good careers in the ILA. Uh, we also have customs on site at our facilities down at the port. Uh, I know a lot of customs officers, go to church with a couple of them, uh, good careers, and they really enjoy that, that business. So I would say there's absolutely a lot of, uh, a lot of careers that are uh, on the peripheral and work in direct conjunction with what we do for sure. Absolutely. And, and don't forget the military. I mean, mm -hmm. the military is huge about moving stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, you can you can take a track in your military careers that puts you on a transportation. In fact, the term logistics itself, that's a military term. That was coined by the military in World War II to describe the movement of supplies and goods to support the war effort. That's where it comes from. 
Uh, so that's a big, big part of it. The, the Navy, the, the Army, uh, I mean, they move a lot of stuff and they have specialists in the supply chain and, and transportation fields that, that you can make a career out of this in your mil in the military side of doing that in the military. Yeah, and let me, let me say this too, you know, not everybody is like Rachel, okay? When it comes to school, right? And so I want you to know that there's a wide range of jobs. I mean, it depends on what, what you like to do in, individually. I mean, there's a lot of folks out there that love to be professional students. There's a lot that don't. And so depending on where you fall on that scale, obviously if you have something related to transportation in your resume, it's gonna help. Logistics, then that's a real popular, it's real popular now. Used to, we had to go to Tennessee and other schools to look for those kind of people, but now you've got U of H and other local schools who are certainly, uh, frankly, they, they have great programs right here at home. So that's a real benefit. And especially when you know Houston's booming in that area. So that's not going away. I mean, we will continue to be the leader. Uh, I, I can't think of a t anybody else that would even come close to us. It's the number one U-Haul destination in the country. I mean, come on, where else do you want to be, right? So. I want to close with this though, I always, how much time do I have? I would keep going all night. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you this, uh, this is something near and dear to my heart and uh, I want you guys to think about this, okay? This is our new motto, it says it's Gulf Winds, our business is always about more than the move. And so uh, here's what I want to say about that, there's a lot of different types of companies out there. It really does matter who you work for. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to go take the job, whoever pays me the most or whatever. Uh, here's what I would tell you. You know, we've been so blessed in our business, and we try and make it about more than just moving freight. And that's what, why we have this posted on our walls when we walk in. We actually work with a, uh, we work with a ministry that we plant orphanages, uh, and we plant churches and orphanages around the world in many different countries. And so... That part of our business, to be able to give back, the local community piece, like Diane's involved with as it relates to the schools. Uh, you know, our mission is to glorify God by providing world-class logistics services through continual investment in our people, our clients, our community, and the world we live in. And so when you have a big purpose, then, you know, the sky's the limit. And so I will say this, there's, there's companies out there that I would tell people I wouldn't go to work there. And it does matter what's the company about. Who are you going to be working for? And so, you know, you have to individually, and it's hard as a young person, I know, when you go in, but look around. I mean, talk to people. You know, don't just go in and take the first one that comes along, right? I mean, you have an opportunity. You're going to be there more than you're with your family. Okay? Think about that. So for me... You know, when I go, I want it to be about more than just the work every day. Because if it becomes just about the work, then you're going to tire out, you're going to be burnt out, and you're just going to be a job hopper. But when you start to buy into something bigger than what you're doing every day, which is really what we're about, then ultimately that's when the great opportunities are there. And you have an opportunity to make an impact in this community, in your family's life, your children, uh, in the world and so what else do you want that's when it's really fulfilling and so at every level of our company you know it doesn't matter if it's me or the person you know uh, whatever they're driving a forklift sweeping the floor taking the trash out whatever it is it's, it really does matter you know how you treat people and what your company's about and I just want to encourage you guys to go to work for somebody that has a greater purpose and there's a lot of good companies that do uh, not just Gulf Winds. I like to brag on, on Gulf Winds because that's our baby, but at the end of the day, there are, there are companies that have a greater purpose, and why, why not be a part of one of those companies, right? Because you're going to feel good about what you do every day, and you'll be helping people in the process. So I'll close with that unless you guys have questions. <laughs> guys to realize what you just experienced these two men are the people that when you go to a very high-end dinner lunch <coughs> or whatever the event in the maritime industry or other just related within the city I'm at those events and I see them and they're the ones that everybody is in line to talk to afterwards you just heard from two of the most respected people in the entire in the entire business 
and maritime world in Houston, Texas, and really around the world, and they spent all this time with you, and even longer than we asked them to spend. And I just can't tell you what experience you just had. And I just want to add one more thing. Golf wins without question. It's one of the most compassionate, generous, successful, brilliant, and hardworking, hardworking companies there is. So if you can possibly get on in any way with Gulf Winds, you would be very happy, I know. And I just wanted to tell you that because I don't know if they even have jobs, but I just know they're like, of course, they're not Anyway, so now I want to just add a couple more things. One is that I think we're not going to have an education, a career seminar in November and December because the holidays and the fourth Thursday, I mean, yeah, the fourth Thursday falls on either Christmas or Thanksgiving, and somehow we didn't think you guys would come. So we'll start again in January. But I want to introduce you to two very important people. And one is I actually am, after the, after the end of November, I'm actually um, leaving, working, retiring I, one more time because I'm now, I retired the first time for my first two twins and now I'm having two more twin grandchildren plus my mother is ill so for family reasons I'm leaving but you will see me at the lectures and all that because I love the museum and it has nothing to do with the museum mm -hmm. only that my time is just got to got to go where my top priority is. But I wanted to share that with you to tell you that Leslie Bolin is going to be our new interim executive director. So the next time you come to a career lecture, Leslie will be here uh, also bringing you in and bringing you in and introducing you and that kind of thing. Leslie is an incredible person, a lady. I've been working with her for about four months. She is the um, she owns PR Square, which is a marketing firm, and she knows everybody in Houston, and she can help put you in touch with some incredible people. So please get to know Leslie. It will greatly benefit you and your career. And next, I want to introduce you to and have just a couple of minutes for you to visit with Al Brooks. Al is the chairman of our education committee. He's probably met with every one of your teachers already, every one of your professors already. He is, he is a volunteer. He has put so much time and done an incredible job. It, Al is an engineer. He retired from Shell Oil Company. He ran all of one Shell and two Shell Plaza. So if that tells you anything about his experience and that sort of thing. He, and to have him come volunteer and do this program for us is such a blessing and we're so <coughs> pleased to have him. So Al, uh, would you come share with us just sure. for a couple minutes about the education program and what's going to be happening in the soon future? Thank you, Dan. Uh, as you know, our, our uh, program right now at the museum is made up of lectures. One lecture is historic lectures and the other is career lectures like today. Well, all of us know and all of us have heard of today the importance of supply chain. Remember, supply chain by definition is the idea of moving a product from its very beginning, even before it's formed, let's say a piece of steel, from the time it's, it's basically iron ore or whatever, all the way into, say, your house. Well, we have a little challenge here in the supply chain as it relates to my world. My world is education, and my world is, is the uh, bringing awareness of the maritime industry. So, t next week's lecture talks about the Port of Houston with a million jobs and 180 billion, now I'm not talking about Obamacare, I'm talking about 180 billion dollars in freight and logistics coming through this town. The supply chain problem is this makes up a large percentage of the people, young people that are thinking about the maritime. You don't have to be a supply chain expert to say you guys can't fill those two numbers. And so our role in the, in the Maritime Museum Education Program is to raise the awareness. You're already ahead of most young people and that you are aware that it's out there. But I can tell you as I travel many, many of the high schools in the northern and western section of this city, I say maritime and they think of sailors, if they think of sailors. Sometimes they don't think about that. So our goal and our passion within the maritime education program is really the organization that brings these wonderful people who have jobs and have opportunities and more importantly have careers and people like you who are looking for those and as was said many times you're very lucky one that you're in the state in the city of Houston where the economy still seems to do very very well secondly you're in a city where <clears throat> the, the port is, depending on how you measure it, either the first, second, or third largest port 
in the United States, soon to be bigger once the Panama Canal ships start going through the newer Panama Canal. And it, third and equally important is we have everything from the maritime academies that were just talked about at Austin and uh, the other high school. Education-wise, you can start from a maritime academy. Or actually, you can start from a lecture like this. You can go to academies. You can go to a, a good array of junior colleges here, San Jack being a perfect example. And then you can go to one of the seven finest maritime uh, academies in the United States, and that's Texas A&M uh, Galveston. So we have everything you need. So from a logistics guy or supply chain, I got everything I need. All I got to do is get it all in line and get uh, young people like yourselves interested, help the instructors in the high schools find ways to get more people interested, and then get you out there. And one of my lecture pieces, I talk about the pyramid of a company. And there is no reason in the world with the education system we have, with the job opportunities we have, that you can't start somewhere in that pyramid and end up at the top of the pyramid. And if you have a dream to be the guy with the four bars on the shoulder of a, of a large ship, you don't have an excuse not to do that. And, you, and I don't think there's many educators that can say that within their cities. So again, you've got to jump on a lot of people. And if you'll help us, we'll fill this place with a lot more people like you. Thank you. Ten or fifteen minutes, you can walk around the museum some more. We also, thankfully, have some bagels from uh, Einstein Bagels in there. So help yourself to that. In addition to the pizza cookies.